If you would like to support the podcast and get some extra content while you're there, head on over to patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast and sign up from the rewatch to the Q&A. We will have loads of content every week. So sign up patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast. And now here's the podcast. Welcome, welcome everybody. It's episode 412 of the Severe MMA Podcast. My name is Sean Sheehan, joined today by the CWC of Irish MMA Media, Graham McDonald. Uh, as we talk about, do you know what, it was a pretty eventful weekend in the world of uh, mixed martial arts. And we will get into all of that in a second. But we, before we get into it, we must tell you that spring has sprung and our friends at Manscaped, the leaders in below the waist grooming, have the best tools for some spring cleaning in your pants. Join the 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and use the promo code SEVERE and get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Manscaped are here to change the way fellas take care of themselves uh, with the performance package 4.0. In that bundle, you'll find a lawnmower 4.0, the weed whacker for your ear and nose hair trimming, the crop uh, preserver ball deodorant and the crop reviver toner as well as the boxer briefs <coughs> and the travel bag to hold all your goodies. The lawnmower 4.0 has the advanced skin safe na- technology. It's a trimmer designed to trim hair on loose skin although your balls might look like punching bags there's no need to treat them like that it's waterproof and LED so you can use it in the dark or in the shower as well then the weed whacker for your ear uh, and nose hair that also has a proprietary skin safe technology reduces nick snags and tugs in those delicate holes then use the pro- a crop preserver a deodorant and crop reviver ball toner. You heard that right. Ball deodorant has changed your life. The two free gifts with that boxer briefs and a shared travel bag. Always use the right tools for the job and head to their website and check out all of the tools to help you upgrade your hygiene routine. So set 20% and get free shipping with the code SevereMatManscape.com. That's 20% off <clears throat> and free shipping with the code SevereMatManscape.com. Your balls will Thank you. And it, there's exciting news as well because we have a new sponsor uh, and uh, it's Caldera Lab. C-I-L-D-E-R-A-L-A-B. Say goodbye to your gen- uh, generic face, wa- face wash on your counter because Caldera Lab are here to save the day when it comes to your skin. Back by the leading clinical trial where 9 out of 10 uh, men experience healthier and visibly improved skin, Caldera Lab has the tools to unlock your Best first impression and confidence. Today we have an exclusive offer for our audience so you can try it yourself um, uh, and see why men trust Caldera Lab for their skin care needs. Use the code Severe at CalderaLab.com for 20% off their best products. I've actually started to use it myself. Caldera Lab were, were generous enough to send us out some of their products, and I'll tell you what. I really like them, you know. I and now you know me. I'm like this uh, old faced, uh, <laughs> haggard old man now at this stage. But you know what? You could feel it. You could feel it already. I've only been using now for a week or so, but it's, it, the old um, the old skin is getting better. Do you know what? It's, it's clearing up a little bit. I sleeping on it middle of the night, waking up early, two hours sleep and all that, and this really helps. It's it's uh, it's really really good. So it uh, Calera Lab creates high performance men's sc- uh, skincare products by combining pharmaceutical grade science along with nature's purest and most potent uh, ingredients kicking off is the regimen bundle a twice a day routine to transform your skin in this bundle you find a clean set base layer and the good clean set first of all that's the start your day it's a balancing cleanser it uses gentle plant-based cleansing leaving all skin types exceptionally refreshed the base layer is a nutrient dense fortified moisturizer that helps your skin and absorbs fast leaving you with matte finish so you can start your day constantly Confidently, and the good is your go-to at night before bed and a clinically proved multifunctional serum that helps your skin look tighter and smoother as well as help visibly reduce uh, wrinkles and fine lines as you age you might notice fine lines wrinkles and signs of aging this is the opposite of what every guy wants and you the more you neglect your skin the more visible uh, you could, be, it could become over time it's time to take control right now um uh, so, are you ready to take your skin game to the next level, Caldera Lab? Look no further than the Icon. I've been using that as well. It's 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 pretty good. The rejuvenating eye serum is here to address three common uh, skin concerns around the eye, fine lines, dark circles, and puffiness. You know, 
all of which a guy who watches them until five o'clock in the morning has committed to transparency, sustainability, and excellence. Kildare Lab is on a mission to better men's uh, skincare around the world, priding itself on clean ingredients and doing right by their customers on the planet we live in. Kildare Lab is a certified B Corporation as well as a member of the 1% for the planet through uncompromised craftsmanship. Craftsmanship, exceptional ingredients, and rigorous transparency. Kildare Labs is here to upgrade your skin and confidence. So get 20% off with the code SEVERAMA at CalderaLab.com. That's 20% off at CalderaLab.com by using code SEVERAMA. Unlock your youthful glow and be ready for summer with Caldera Lab. So if you want to spell that, C A L D E R A L A B dot com. Right, Graham. Uh, let's get into it, and uh, we should talk about. I suppose the biggest news of the weekend was uh, was the Max Holloway and and Aaron and Lallan fight, headlining uh, last night's UFC card. And you know, it was one of those fights coming into it. You were thinking like, and and do you know what? It was weird. I, I didn't really, I didn't really hear much coverage or anything coming into it. But in my own mind, I kind of said, look, everyone is is kind of willing Arnold Allen to be the guy who kind of gets over Max Holloway, hopefully because we have something new. But at the same time, we're thinking like, well, and I gave Max Holloway as one of my bets of the week. Like, you're thinking, Jesus, Max Holloway is a tough guy to beat. He's not go- just going to lay down. He's probably thinking, look, if Yair wins, I'm right back uh, in the mix. Obviously, Yair fighting, Yair Rodriguez fighting Volkanovski coming up, who's the champion and the interim champion. And... I think it kind of just played out that way, maybe in terms of Max Holloway still having lots left in the tank and still Max Holloway still being a top fighter. Um, Somehow I feel like we all, and maybe we did not, but a lot of us kind of, we, we 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 wish sometimes a way of life, <laughs> you know, we wish a way of MMA thinking like, this is the way it should be. Like l- last week, we had the Rob font Yanez fight. We're like, right, so Yanez is going to beat Font now, and then he's going to go on, and he's going to fight Yan, maybe, and then he fight for Font. Didn't happen. Billy Q, he's going to beat Edson Barbosa. We'll get to that later on. And he'll maybe move on, get into the top 15, go, didn't happen. It does, MMA, it doesn't always happen like that. It does not, it just doesn't always happen like that. And that, it was one of those fights that we'll get into, and there's a lot of intricacies in this fight. But if you're to look at the overall story of that, I said it last week as well about Font in the the fact that he just wouldn't allow Yanez to take his spot. He just wouldn't allow him to move. And I felt like Holloway was a little bit like that here as well. I didn't think it was vintage Holloway. I didn't think it was Holloway's best performance. I saw John Annick putting up the numbers literally there just before I started. And it was it's still very good numbers and still better than almost everyone. But not Holloway's sort of numbers. And it was a different sort of fight, so you can understand that. But this wasn't like a blowaway Holloway fight. And you have to give Aaron Allen credit for that as well. But it felt like it was one where he just... I have what I hold and I'm going to stay here. And I respect the fact that he fought Aaron Allen because it's it's easy to say, we look at this one from Aaron Allen's point of view a lot. It's easy to say, like, oh, shit, Aaron Allen's getting a very tough fight. But, like, Max Holloway got a very tough fight as well in a position where if it was a weight class above, he'd never take the fucking fight because the likes of Gaethje and the likes of, uh, even though he did take one against Fizia, but the likes of Aria and, and uh, Chandler, they just, like, refuse to take these fights and they just kind of fight each other uh, in a roundabout way, whereas Max Holloway to his credit, it has never done that and isn't doing it now. So I thought that was the story of last night. Did you did when you watch Holloway coming out when you saw the fight uh, starting? What was what was your general thoughts? What was your thoughts coming into it? Because it is. It, I feel like it was one of those fights, Graham, where it was kind of easy to get carried away with. Okay, Arnold, it's Arnold, Arnold Allen's time now. Whereas Max Holloway is still really fucking there as a top fighter, isn't he? Yeah, he definitely is. As you said, it probably wasn't his best performance. Like you go back and find better performances, but he's up against a, a, a hard guy who's trying to land big shots. And you know, you kind of maybe Max Holloway fought a little bit differently than he would against a, another opponent, but. You know, for me, I thought actually Max Holloway would probably win this this fight and this decision a little bit easier than he did. Like in the first round, I thought, you know, Allen was doing pretty well. I think the round kind of slipped away from him in the, in the last minute or a minute and a, and a half. But he responded well in the second. Like, and, you know, he put it up to Max. You could see that he, you know, he knew that it was he, he needed to make something happen. And he, even in the fifth round, when, when he was down, uh, likely down on, on the scorecards and he didn't finish, he, like he went for it and he put himself on the line and, you know, sometimes you, you you watch back a fight and you say, oh, he he, he should have done this or he should have came on stronger. You know, I think he, he just kind of came up against the the better guy on the night, and it was a it was a difficult matchup from the win. And although he did put it up to Max Holloway, I think it was clear enough that he that he 
that he had won uh, the Max Holloway had won the fight but Arnold Allen you know he it was a difficult fight for him as we talked about before it was kind of like you know you won all these fights in a row and now you gotta you gotta face Max Holloway and maybe as you kind of hinted at people were kind of hoping for the division sake you know not for for like you know against Max Holloway or anything like Max Holloway is a like nobody really has a bad word to say about Max Holloway but just for the freshness of the division it seemed like you know maybe maybe a lot of people wanted uh, Allen to do it for that but you know, <laughs> the way MMA goes, if he had a, a won, you never know if he, a year is going to go in there and win. So, yeah, just uh, I suppose uh, Max Holloway probably felt a bit slighted that people were kind of, you know, the odds were so close and people were kind of hoping for, for Arnold to win. But he came out there and proved he's still at the very top level, you know, besides obviously Volkanovski, who's just unfortunate for Max that he's kind of like come at the same time as him or or it's overlapped at least by, by a lot of years. And Max maybe would have been, you know, an even longer reigning champion and one of the all-time greats you know hopefully he's obviously trying to get another shot of Volkanovski but I, it just it just doesn't really seem to you know get the fans up or um, get the excitement going so it is a bit of a, a tricky situation uh, the UFC are in now especially if uh, if Alex wins yeah like Holloway's calling out the Korean zombie now after that like if he puts four or five fights together absolutely but it's going to take four or five fights you know this isn't a lightweight situation where you win one fight and you're right back into a title fight and I think we Max Holloway has gone through that you know he's gotten title fights you know too quickly I think and and this is what happens uh, when you do that. Look, but you said he came up against such a great fighter in Volkanovski, the pound for pound best fighter in the world uh, right now. In, in my opinion, I think a lot of people's opinions as well. But you know, obviously, Makachev and, and John Jones are in that conversation as well. Maybe a couple more. But I, um, I said it on a couple of podcasts recently. I think Max Holloway is the best fighter in the UFC right now, or one of them anyway that doesn't hold the belt. And I, I would, st- I would still stand by that. Although I did. I didn't think he was as good last night as he normally is, and I wa- I wonder is that him, you know, being a bit nervous in that fight. I wonder is him getting a little bit older. He's taken a lot of shots and given a lot of shots down through the years, but also he's come through a good few wars now against Volkanovski as well. And it's not always uh, it's not always that easy. You know, we spoke about it before some of the Volkanovski uh, fights, and obviously, you know, we're this card wasn't as big coming in and this fight wasn't as big so we weren't putting you know concentrating on this as much maybe as others but uh, that's still I think an issue for Max Holloway and it's going to be look what happened to Frankie Edgar look what happened to BJ Penn and all guys who had a lot of fight time in there you don't ride for free and that's definitely a concern for Max Holloway over the last time uh, the, the next while sorry was it last but in fairness to him like he is showing a, like you know uh, still a great chin solid chin and yeah. doesn't doesn't like react badly and takes the shots well and they mentioned on the commentary and he's mentioned over previous fights that he doesn't really spar anymore so maybe that's um, you know that's a good decision when you've taken you've been in the ring or in the cage for so long and taken do you so believe many shots that? to the head do you believe he doesn't spar? Um, I'd say he does spar a little but I'd say he doesn't spar like anything like what what we were back in the day you know back when Max Holloway was coming through and old school gym mentalities of beating the head off each other I'd say that's probably probably not happening yeah I, I would say that's probably not happening but I, I would be very skeptical about him not sparring in Gambler remember there was a video came out of him sparring there <laughs> from before one of his racing fights uh, yeah I I don't buy that whatsoever. Yeah, I think he, I think he's, he must be sparring a little bit, but I, I'd say it's probably more that he's not sparring compared to what he what he, what he used to. Yeah, maybe maybe on that. Um, let's talk about the the fight itself and maybe the the intricacies and the tactics of it. Uh, look, it was one of those fights I look back on and I think. I think, do you know, sometimes you, you see, uh, like I say, uh, Man City are playing or Liverpool are playing or, or even Man United to a, to a certain extent and they don't, they don't play the way they have been playing normally or, you know, a fighter doesn't fight the way they have been fighting normally and you, you see an opportunity, there's an opportunity there and it's not taken, you know, Man City end up getting a late goal and winning 2-1 or, you know, you've Liverpool at Anfield and the crowd goes, like like, like Arsenal-Liverpool, the last day, you know, Liverpool playing are really badly, Arsenal up 2-0, the opportunity's there, but something turns and, you know, Liverpool go on and, and they, 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 they get the draw. That happens in sports all the time, right? And I feel like watching that fight, and it's not even necessarily from Max Holloway's point of view, because I'm kind of back and forth on whether I think Max Holloway, you know, lost the step last night. I'm actually not sure. I just know he, you know, as I said, is it a thing of just a a slightly off night? He was still very good. 
I just think Arnold Allen, you look back in that fight and I think there's ways to win it. Like I had the fight 3 2, and we'll get into that why in a second. But you said it there, and I, I have it in my notes as well. The last 70 seconds of the first round, Max Holloway upped the pace and he won the round. If he hadn't have done that, if Allen had kind of kept the, 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 the show going for that 70 seconds, he would have won the fight. You know, he would have. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think opinion. he tried to, though. I think Max Holloway just realized that here, I'm going to step it up here. And, That's true. you know, when Max Holloway does that, it's like we've seen it time and time again. It's extremely difficult to deal with. And, you know, uh, I, I think it was more Max Holloway kind of, you know, rose to, to, to win the round rather than Alan let it slip away. But I, I it would did, agree. You know, I, yeah, it did slip away from him at the end of the day. Yeah. I, that's exactly it. Not letting it slip away, I suppose you you make a good point. Rather than you know he he was helped to, to let it slip away by Max Holloway in a big way. But let, let's say if he didn't, it's a different fight. Now obviously the the, the judges' scorecards were a little bit different because only one judge gave the second round to Aaron Lannan, which I was very surprised at. I thought he 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 definitely won that round. He was jabbing more landing combos. Max did come back later in that round again, but I don't think nearly as much as the first round. It wasn't nearly uh, as close. Um, in the third round. This this is where I think it all kind of not necessarily fell apart for Arnold, Allen, but I think the the limitations of his game plan really showed uh, in the third and fourth rounds. He was throwing lots of jabs, but there was no left hands coming after it. Max was kind of just controlling the fight here, and you see a tweet coming up from Teddy Atlas, and he's saying he's like the the conductor of the orchestra or whatever, and that's really what it looked like here. And that's probably why he had a, li- a little bit less shots than normally because he was kind of waiting on Allen, kind of jabbing him, touching him from the outside, being more varied. And I think variation was a huge thing. You see in the four round as well like it was just the left hand from Aaron Lallan Re- really he was throwing the jab and then he was throwing the left hand and Max started parrying it go back and watch that four round anyone just watch every time Alan throws the left hand now he actually did land one nice one to be fair but Max just parrying it and parrying it and parrying it every single time and he was dipping his head to the left as well to get away from the left hand which would have been at his right side you know that Alan came on late and made it closer but it just I, I think and in the fifth round Aaron Lallan kind of emptied the tank and I think won that round Max kind of half dropped him late and landed some big shots late but I think Alan did too but I think he was well ahead I do think Alan won that that fifth round um, I saw some people calling the four round close I really I really don't think it was to be honest I, I just th- those limitations again I think that was the biggest part of the fight I think if Aaron Lallan was a little bit more varied and found more than one shot or one sequence of shots he really could have been there for the win and like why didn't he go for a takedown like and not to even get the takedown but just to change things up you go for a takedown by faking like an overhand left or something like that the next time you throw the overhand left he's thinking about the takedown and maybe you land a little bit more and all it takes in a fight like that where in my opinion there was only one round in it is a couple of overhand lefts like that I said that four round I, I didn't think I, I thought uh, Max Holloway won it but imagine uh, Arnold Allen you know spent a minute against the cage with uh, with Max landing less shots and then he got out next thing he lands a big left hand as well as the big left hand he landed late there's a whole different complexion to that round there then and it was just I think you know not necessarily even fight IQ but high level five round fight IQ a thing you can only learn by learning it in, in a fight like this yeah it it's was his exactly. first five round fight as well I believe wasn't it, it, it first Alan's. fight that went to five rounds anyway the last fight yeah, yeah the first rounds, time he yeah. went five rounds yeah yeah, yeah. Did you think that kind of played a factor? Um, yeah, well, it probably did. You know, when, when you have experience doing that, it's just second nature. When, when you haven't really done it before, it's probably in the back of your mind. But, I, you know, I, I don't think it played in too much. I just think that Holloway is just a difficult matchup for, for him and for anybody. And, you know, even in the third round, or the, sorry, the fifth round, you mentioned there, the I, I thought uh, originally on watching when I put in my scorecard to have made decisions that Alan had kind of, you know, gone for broke and kind of just wildly kind of got hit but he was just off balance and, and fell at the very end but actually looking back on it afterwards <laughs> I, I it was actually a really nice uh, couple of shots by Holloway and you know made the round closer but I still would have probably gave it to Allen you know second and fifth to Allen so if he you know as you said if he just had a maybe you know landed one big impactful shot in one of those first, third, and fourth rounds, you know, it could have been a different story. It could have changed the fight or if he had got a, gotten a takedown. He did try to go for a couple of takedowns, but they were kind of more pushing against the cage and Holloway was just able to circle out pretty pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I, I just think, I think Alan fought, like, you know, as good as as good as expected or to be expected, but 
I just think sometimes you just come up against a difficult matchup on a guy who's experienced in, in five rounds and, you know, knowing when to up it to take a round like he did in the in the first round. Because if he hadn't, if Holloway hadn't have done that, he could have, you know, the second round went away. He could have been two rounds in the hole there. So it was uh, it was brilliant for Max Holloway and just um, decision making in, in these moments and knowing when to up it and knowing, you know, uh, just knowing the lay of the land, and I think that definitely plays in with Alan. You know, you can you can do it in the gym or whatever. It's it definitely get your cardio and things up there, get you used to it. But it's I think it must be different going into a into a fight, especially you know a big main event against Max Holloway, who's been at the top of the division as you're coming up and things like that. And there's a lot of things going on. And I think I think he did like rise to the occasion, Alan. But it just it just was beaten by the better guy uh, on the day. Yeah, I I would agree. He definitely he, he fought well. And I don't think cardio was an issue. He was still going strong in the fifth round, as both of them were. I, I, I genuinely just think it was kind of, it was experience and the the, the five round experience, uh, yes, but also like the tactical experience to win a fight like that. Because the I, I said there, like Alan was throwing lots of um, lots of left hands early, lots of combinations. Then there was lots of jabs and no combinations, and then it was kind of just you know. It, it, it that you, we went to the fourth round then where he kind of he couldn't left land a left hand at all and then the fifth came out and it was a bit different but the reason why that happened for a big part was Max Holloway because you're fighting most lads and you're Arnold Allen and you're that good and that physically commanding and that powerful you land a couple of those left hands and they stop hitting you back you know most lads are not going to stand there in the pocket like Max Holloway and go, okay, yeah, you, I saw that. I'm going to hit you with a few as well. And you saw maybe in the second or third round that like a little maybe trickle of blood came from the nose of Randall or a little bit of redness. And what, where is that coming from? That's coming from Max Holloway answering Allen's combos with combos of his own. And when you when that happens, what's the first fucking natural thing to do is like, okay, I'm getting hit there. I'm not having a massive effect. So let's kind of draw that back a little bit. And when he draws that back, that was the only thing that was working for him. That was the only thing that was, um, you know, that was getting him success. And when he stopped doing that because Holloway was having success in his successful area, it, there was just nothing else there. And that's why I say the variation. Because you needed, like Holloway was uh, countering the combos in the second and third, mostly the third, and in the fourth, he was just parrying the left hand. Like, you need something else there. I know he tried a few head kicks early. They kind of dried up. There was very little leg kicks of note or anything big there. It could have added in a few of that. That front leg of Holloway is always there. He's not a one for throwing big knees up through the middle or anything like that. Like, wrestle him. And, and as I said, I'll say it again. <clears throat> I'm not saying fucking double leg him and take him down. Just pick him up. And hold him there for a second and make it tough on him and don't let him conduct the orchestra. And I think that's the thing. If they watch back that fight, there's a few, like, honestly, if they fought again, I, I think I'd have a hard time not picking Arnold Allen to win the second time if they were able to, to just look at it and adjust it. Now, what do you think of Faraz Abbey? Because I don't know, it's like, is Faraz a top coach? Is he the type of guy that'll go back and look at that and actually dissect it? Like I have my, I I, I used to always think that about Faraz, uh, but I'm not sure I think it anymore. If I'm being honest, I, I just I I feel like maybe Faraz is like the, this generation's Greg Jackson, Mike Winklejohn, where they were the best at one stage, and maybe the game has moved past them a little bit. Like what's coming out of their gym right now? What's coming out of Canadian MMA? Very little, it seems at the moment. So yeah, it, I think that's maybe a part of it as well. With Aaron Lallan be better off going away somewhere else, and and you know somewhere that can you know show him what went wrong there because like. I was skeptical enough whether Aaron Lallan had like the the full ability to beat someone like Max Holloway. I know everything he has, but I think he had it. I think last night he was on the precipice of winning that fight if he just added in a little bit more, and uh, it just yeah, it just wasn't there. But it was. Uh, it was yeah, an interesting but he, even if he added in those things you're looking for, like I'd be. I'd be confident enough that Max Holloway would at least recognize that and try to you know up it and change it. He's very adaptable. Uh, it obviously would have been a different fight and it's easy to go back now and, and say it, but, you know, uh, I, I just think it was a difficult matchup from the start for Alan. And as you said, he put on a really good showing and did really well and came very close on a lot of people's scorecards. Uh, it was only one round in at a swing round. So 
you know, uh, uh, swing as, round. As, as this swing, easy, this easy to swing be the general round. after the battle. <laughs> it, it is, uh, yeah. And you're 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 right now. This swing round, though, they kept saying swing round. The fourth round is the swing round. It's like, why did they keep saying that? Like, why? I, I thought that was fucking bizarre. Like the first round was very close as well. That kind of could have gone either way. Why wasn't that the swing round? What's this swing around the bullshit about? Like in the in the middle of a fight, like fair enough. After the fight, you can go all right. The first and second were close. Third and fourth were close. The fifth round of the swing round, or whatever. Not in this fight, but in any fight. You know, that's I don't know. Fucking bizarre. God, uh, don't get me started in the commentary because it was maybe the worst it's ever been last night. Like Brendan Fisher is horrendous. DC, we all know that. Bisping, Bisping when he's with DC is just oh my god. It was relentlessly bad. Just, re- just. Oh my god! It was so awful, so awful. Just talking about barbecue every two minutes. Okay, we get it. There's nice barbecue in Kansas City. Fuck me, Jesus. Anyway, any any final thoughts on the main event, Graham? Before we, before we move on, it was it was a, it was a good fight. Like it was a pretty good fight. Not yeah, fight I enjoyed year. it. It was like as it was on the, it was on a knife edge. Like you know, it could have went either way. In in a lot of the rounds, if if you know one guy had landed. To, a big shot it, it could have changed around and in, in like it nearly did in the in the fifth round if, if you know judges had scored other rounds differently like that, that that last knockdown in the last minute or in the last second could have been it and you know fair play to max holloway he's not one to shy away from if somebody at the end of a fight that max holloway is winning wants to throw down for the last 20 seconds or whatever he's always down for it even though even though it's dangerous and you know he's 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 definitely an entertaining fighter and i always enjoy a max holloway fight and you know, uh, even though a lot of people um, and probably me wanted wanted for the sake of the division, probably Arnold to win. But you know, Max Holloway has yeah, everything everything he has and everything every, everything he's achieved. He's he's done through hard work and deserved it. He hasn't been given an easy road or anything like that. So yeah, it's good to see Max Holloway is still you know close to the top and he hasn't fallen off. You know, a few years ago there was a lot of worries when when the way cut and the the droopy eye and kind of slurring his words that Biz been called him out for on TV and that that was that looked really bad and he's he's bounced back and you know shown little to no effect ill effects of that. So yeah, it's great to see Max Holloway still at the top. And Arnold Allen, you know, he'll he'll come again. It was maybe, you know, coming in it was it was a difficult matchup for him and improved that way. But he can go back and maybe I don't know, I, I don't pay as much attention maybe to the coaching side of things as you, but maybe you know, yeah, I'm sure he'll go back and look over and, and work on things and, you know, become a better fighter through this. And he's still early in his career. You know, he's still he's still a, a young guy in terms of, you know, uh, the UFC, even even though he's been around and he's had loads of injuries and stuff, he hasn't got that much wear and tear on him. And uh, the experience of five rounds against a really top level guy like that will always stand to a fighter as well. Uh, indeed. Let's move on uh, and talk about the rest of the cards. It, look, it was it was one of those cards. It was, it was one of the fights where everyone just in the crowd just started like not necessarily booing but they just got so bored that they were like ah oh, we don't care about it i wasn't even that bad of a fight i think it was a muñoz fight and uh this is a real problem for the ufc because when they put on so there was 14 fights in this and like there's so many fights it's just mean nothing now all these fights mean something to the fighters absolutely and i i don't want anyone like said oh you've no respect for the fight i absolutely do but i i also have respect for the fans, I also have respect for for the audience, and like you UFC need to do a better job of putting on fights that fucking matter. Like they're just and like they can't, they actually can't. When you have forty two events a year or whatever it is, you cannot put on ten to fourteen fights a night that people are going to care about. And if you put on fourteen, they will get like this. They they just will. It's impossible not to. We're all sitting at home. We get like four fights in. Or like, oh god, what's fucking coming next? Like there was one stage last night. I was like, right, we're into the main card now. And it was like, oh, there was an hour and a half until the main card. And uh, are these fights still going on? They just went on and on and on and on and fucking on. And even when there's a great fight, or even when there's a great knockout, it's always almost followed by like, okay, it's followed by fucking whatever fucking Gillian Robertson versus Piera Rodriguez or fucking Gaston Bolaños versus Aaron Phillips like who gives a bollocks like really like oh I don't know it's just a lack of jeopardy it's just like oh it doesn't really matter who wins this yeah and like when you watch say a cage warriors card or something like that 
those sort of fights have jeopardy on that because if this lad wins it, maybe wins one more, he could be fighting for a title and on his way to the UFC. So, like, people are always saying, oh, there's other things you can watch and there's uh, there's lower, this is highest level of MMA. That's grand. That is grand. It might be a high level MMA, but it doesn't mean as much as lower level MMA. It just doesn't. And that's a, I don't know, it's a massive problem for the UFC. It, the UFC is becoming more and more like boxing all the time in that I, if I was a casual fan, there's no way I'm tuning in to see all of this card on Dylan May. You know, I see like even, M- even if I'm a casual fan mm-hmm. going to the UFC in like Vegas or something or Kansas City and I'm looking at the card, there's 14 fights, I'm probably like, oh, I can just turn up like, you know, halfway through the, the televised prelims. I don't really need to be there from the very start, especially if you're, you know, if you're there to support, if you're not really a, a hardcore fan, you're there to support a certain fighter or, you know, a couple of fighters, you, you're probably not rushing to get in there. Like, and that's, that's like boxing. Like you say, boxing slowly filters in and, you know, we're kind of used to that in, in Las Vegas and stuff, but it's going to start happening in other places when people are just, you know, people realize that these, these cards are going to be going on all night. <laughs> and Like 14 fights. I, I talked about this before, 11, 11 fights, 10 fights is in my opinion, ideal for a fight card. Um, especially when the with the UFC's pacing and all the waiting and promos in between, it does become uh, it does become a the long haul <laughs> when it doesn't really need to. You know, um, if you miss the first few fights, would it would it really matter I don't, to most people? I don't think so. And you know, as you as Dana used to say in the past, like they didn't want that to happen, and now they they seem to not care. I yeah, I, I think like so. There was boxing on BT Sports last night, and Joe Joyce was was boxing the main event. I, I attempted to actually watch it. It was over by the time I actually tuned in. But, like, I would have just tuned in for JoJo's. I wouldn't even have heard who else is on the card. Like, maybe if I heard there was fucking, I don't know, like Josh Warrington or something was in the call main event. Like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll, like, Edson Barboza in the call main event. I probably would have tuned in and watched that if I'm, like, the casual fan or whatever. But are you tuning in for Azmat Murkazanov against just Dust, Dustin Jacoby? You're fucking, you're not, like, you're just not. And it's not even the, the live fan. Because, the more like, the live fan, especially in some or maybe like a Kansas City who's you know it's not the biggest place in the world they probably don't get a lot of stuff um, you're probably coming for the whole car you're probably coming for making a night out of it or whatever and it's it's always you know great, better for the, the live fan although in this case it necessarily wasn't maybe the fact that they were in early was, was the trouble but for the viewer at home like are those prelims going to be doing big numbers like the, the more it goes I, I think that is a big issue for them because we all know how uh, and especially with the, the WWE UFC merger now these TV numbers are going to be massive of like when you have fights in the middle and that you know that's why they they put on uh the Brandon Rival Matthias Nicolau fight there and then why he was like oh I made a mistake well like you know exactly what you were doing like it was a fight you thought people actually might tune in for so to, to, to boost that prelim number and that's exactly what they're doing sometimes like they, they talk about it a lot in wrestling I listen to lots of the podcasts and stuff um and you know it's an open thing like oh this is the rating that was the rating like it feels like in MMA since Dave Meltzer's not writing about it anymore for MMA fighting we never hear about that anymore I can't remember the last time I heard about uh, a rating and uh, the UFC very much know about it and the, the higher ups there very much think about it and care about it but it's something I don't think we talk about probably enough to be honest and uh, yeah anyway look it's I don't I don't I really don't think that's a good thing for MMA in terms of uh, this, this these cards being like so top heavy that doesn't mean there aren't good fighters on it that doesn't mean there aren't good cards in it or that there, 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 there aren't good fights in it but uh yeah it's it's just, just the product isn't isn't mostly tv no, anymore no. from you know start to finish not even close because at least before it wasn't even that they were better it wasn't even that you know the, the fighters are better the fights are better or anything like that there was just because there was less fighters you always thought like a lad could have a possible run to get to the very top. Now you're looking and you, uh, the rankings are a problem with this as well because you see a lad in the rankings and he's like 15 and ring, ah, well, look, he has fucking four fights, five fights to win to even get to a title shot or whatever. Whereas before, you could see a lad coming into the UFC, he has a couple of good wins. They're like, oh, do you know what? He might be too far away from getting there to, towards the very top. We, we, that, that disillusion isn't even there anymore, you know, or the, the illusion. But uh, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll move on. Um, Barbosa, another guy who just wasn't having his spot taken. Look, Billy Q is uh, is a good fighter and like a funny guy and everything like that. But at, I was thinking of it just before the fight came on, and I looked at the price and I saw Barbosa was the underdog. And I was like, I cannot believe this fucking price. I really, really can't believe it. Now I would have been given out because. Uh, I, I got four out of four of my bets on my uh, Charlotte Benton show this week, so I would have been mad at myself if I hadn't given this and in my one of my other bets didn't work. But 
like this was just levels here I think like Barboza is just a level ahead of Billy Q uh, landed the beautiful knee right down through the middle after landing a couple of shots before that well it wasn't to say that like oh I saw it coming or anything like that but like when he stopped a few of those takedowns when he circled out um it was only I feel like this fight was only kind of going one way and like yeah. Barbosa is one of those guys as well you, you he fights at a certain level up high and he's he's going to struggle because of le- le- certain limitations but when you drop him down any bit of a level at all he's going to absolutely destroy those guys and uh, that's what he did here against Billy Q it was a lovely knee wasn't it yeah I actually didn't even see the knee whatever the angle or whatever I must have I don't know what happened but I didn't even see it Lana wasn't even sure what had happened but I just I saw something really, you know, uh, quick had happened. And on the replay, it was obviously he snuck it in there beautifully. And I was going to say what, what kind of what you said there, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big, you know, step up in competition for somebody like Billy Q and uh, and for Edinburgh Bowes, it's a pretty big step down. And once Billy Q couldn't get to, you know, I think he knew he needed to get the take down early. Edson's uh, really dangerous early, especially if you, if you let him start teeing off on the feet. And uh, once Billy Q couldn't get the takedown, it did seem like, oh, this, this is bad news. And Edson put him away really nicely. Not, nice one for the highlight reel and kind of showed that he's still there. And, you know, you can see the fire in him, even in the celebration and the and the um, post-fight interview that, you know, he's he's definitely still still uh, hungry to to prove that he's that he's one of the top fighters. And, you know, he, he probably knew going in that it, this is a must win, really, for his top level chances. And he went in there very impressively and, you know, kind of had his way with Billy Q and you know as you said showed that there, there are levels to this indeed he moves on and we'll, we'll see what's next for him um, the Munoz fight then this was obviously the one where they were kind of going a bit uh, a bit mad on it he, uh, he put on a good performance you know I uh, he won the first round a big knockdown two and three were close I gave the second uh, to uh, to Munoz um, one of those fights where I, th- I think that, I, I think Cruz Gutierrez, and I, I, I'm not sure about this, and we will obviously see, but it felt like he got concussed with that big shot, and you could hear him between rounds, and they said, why are you not throwing any of your, this, you know, your spinning stuff, the stuff we planned, kind of, and he was just like, I'm not feeling it. It just felt like he was a guy whose head wasn't in. It was funny, I was listening to a podcast the other day about a hurler who got a, uh, who got a concussion in the game. He said, the next ball that came to me, I put up my hand to catch it, and I just ran past it. You know, you just when you get a concussion you get hit hard like that you you, just, you don't know where you are sometimes and you're, you're fighting on instinct maybe sometimes and like he did well to, to be close to it but it, it's tough when you get hit that hard that he did to, to just keep going never mind fight uh, another two rounds so look Chris Gutierrez is, is, is a talented guy and I'm sure he'll be back but again another one yeah, that, here that'd be worrying you know you'd want to probably take a little while off getting, getting hit in the head for a few months here you know usually we see a guy gets rocked or concussed and they kind of Either get finished, or they, or they can kind of recoup in in ten, twenty seconds of, of kind of circling away and kind of get back to where they were. But yeah, if it's kind of continuing through fifteen minutes or or like that, then yeah, I, I'd be I'd be very precautious about that, especially you know with with the concussion and uh, the stuff that's been coming out over the last few years. So yeah, as a you know, he put up a, a decent fight and kind of his third round is probably his best round. But uh, I thought Munoz actually did enough uh, in each round and. Uh, look very good. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a tough night for Gutierrez. Yeah, no, that is uh, that's Doctor Shanshi in there as well. Now, and that's pure speculation. I don't know if he was actually concussed or not, but that's that's just what it looked like to me. And and wh- whether he was concussed or whether it was, uh, uh, you know, just just him feeling the effects of the shot, and it wasn't a concussion. Either way, I think that's the way the fight went. But credit to Munoz, he uh, he caused that, and and he did a, a great job there. Um, the two fights that happened just above that, um, Murzakhanov against Jacoby, you know, Murzakhanov landed a couple of big shots early, won the first couple of rounds, and then Jacoby did the glory kickbox legend, turned into a wrestler towards the end, and, uh, yeah, that wasn't, uh, Murzakhanov did very well in the first couple of rounds, he was, he was actually losing, I think, the second round, but didn't get back and hit him hard at the, the end of the second round, he went a bit cheat of air on in the second round, but it was the start of the first round, if I believe, and then uh, the third round was relatively even, but, uh, yeah, good win for Murzakhanov, Murzakhanov, not a massive standout. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, f- fucking this Tanner Bowles or Yanku the Lava fight. Uh, we have a new player at 205 pounds, they announced with, <laughs> with Tanner Bowles, sir. Just before the fight, I was like, are you fucking well? Like, a new player at 205 pounds, Tanner Bowles, uh, And then, 
Kutalaba proceeds to come out and uh, just destroy him. Um, look, Kutalaba is one of those guys. Uh, I gave him as one of my bets of the week. Based on, like, I think he has a good two minutes in him. And I don't know, does Ban- Tanner Bowser have a good two minutes in him? Like, Kutalaba will just, like, if, if that fight had gone on, right? John Murray was ground and pounding him against the cage. Well, ground and pounding him is not the word, but pounding him against the cage. Um, if, if, Bowser had somehow survived that. I think he would have probably won the fight because Kutalaba will always find a way to lose. <laughs> always after a situation like that. But he is very good at the start. You just have to weather the storm of Kutalaba and you'll almost certainly win. But Tanner Bowser wasn't able to do that. So a good win for Ian Kutalaba. Um, then we had the Rafa Garcia Clay Guida fight. Clay Guida the fake, the fake retirement at the end. Fake, fake <laughs> retirement. Bill Algeo fake retirement. Uh, Clay Guida. He should retire because he looked fucking horrendous. He looked 100 years old. Uh, he can't move anymore. He can't bounce anymore. He couldn't even burp between rounds. Uh, and I was disappointed with Rafa Garcia, to be honest. He was just jabbing him all night. And look, he won, and he won a, uh, a, a decent uh, win, unanimous decision. And well, clearly won out every round. But, like, you're finding the very much you are finding the ghost of Clay Guida's ghost last night you want to be out there making a statement yeah Yeah. take him down fucking submit him Clay Guida's been submitted 11 times in his career you can't knock him out do that like come on it's yeah it was it was a good performance from Garcia but like one that will not get you noticed one that will not move you forward Uh, yeah it was just so I thought that was very, very frustrating just, just jabbing him up and jabbing him up, and I love a jab. Everyone knows that. But come on, lads, come on, let's let's do something there. Um, one of the most interesting fights tonight was this Bill Elgio TJ Brown fight because I, I kind of, I knew what was going to happen here in that first round, even though TJ Brown was like well ahead and all. But this was one of those fights you watch it. I know we are. We will talk about another fight as well, but judging in a minute. But you talk about effect and. I, I, I'm going to make up numbers here, right? But let, let's say TJ Brown landed 30 punches in the first round and Bill Algeo landed 10, right? TJ Brown was landing beautiful punches, slipping underneath shots, slamming him to the body, just clean, crisp, hard, powerful shots. And Bill Algeo got a bit of a bloody nose and a bit of a red face, but didn't really show any side effects, Right was just kind of walking through him. So durable. Bill Algeo landed 10 shots, and every time he landed a shot, I thought TJ Brown was going to go down. Like, every single time he landed a good shot, and maybe it, was, maybe it wasn't 10 good shots, maybe it was two or three good shots. Every time, I was like, oh, shit, TJ Brown's been hurt by that. And then what happened in the the um, uh, the, the second round was exactly that. He did get hurt. Um, could not take the shot as well as Algeo. And he ended up uh, getting him down and, and submitting him. And you, this is a, a fight, never forget it, that your ability is one of the most important things you can have in MMA. You can be as good or better than anyone. And if you're not durable, if their shots have more of an effect than your shots, you will lose. Even if your shots are better. It's, and we look, we're judging all the time. We talk about it, the effectiveness. The effectiveness is not only the aggressors are the the uh the the the, the forward going strikes you know the, the 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 offensive strikes it's also the way they be are the, the way they can be or the way they are absorbed if you absorb them really well like a max holloway who's like oh yeah we didn't get touched or if you absorb them like fucking you know the, the last days of Chuck Liddell where he gets touched once and he's knocked spark out there's a big difference between that yeah. and that was what was the difference here I think like I think uh, just to ask your question you know it, it, we probably would have been talking about it a lot more if if you know, the decision had been more contentious but that last round between Holloway and, and Allen you know Holloway's or Allen's kind of winning the round you know landing more but then Holloway drops him at the very end like how would you uh, have scored that if, uh, I how saw, did you score that I, I scored it for Allen but like if you look at that right uh, and I, I think this because is a, like, like, kind of what you're saying. You can be winning like four minutes and 55 seconds, yeah. get hit with a huge shot, and then he steals the round. But maybe in this case, he Alan had done enough. But it, it is a hard one, you know, when somebody gets dropped hard like that. Uh, he, I, I think what the judge, I think if you watch back that, right, and watch it actually, like, because you said you went back and you watched the shot afterwards and you could see it, right? Uh, which is a smart thing to do, but the judges don't have that privilege, right? Watch it, the, the live coverage, when it shows Alan getting dropped and see what the bell goes and see what happens. He pops right back up and he's hugging Max Holloway. He doesn't show any ill effects of it, right? So it, 
to the judges are looking at that and go, oh, was, was he hurt by that? And then the next thing you see him, he's just standing immediately up and he's hugging someone, talking, not wobbling. No, you know, there was a similar thing that happened with uh, Darren Till and Robert Whitaker, I believe, in, in a fight they had. Pop right back up, showed no ill effects. If uh, Aaron Allen had popped back up there, fell backwards, Max Holloway had to catch him. He had to take a, just a little stumble. Yes. I, I think that would have scored more highly. Yeah, if he if you there was a thought, or oh, maybe he saved but by the bell. Would that have been enough? Would that have been enough to win the round? In your opinion, oh. if he had stood up and kind of stumbled? Not. I don't think that round. To be honest, I thought Aaron Allen was well ahead. I thought he landed some very good shots, and it was for the first time in the fight in that fifth round. I did think they had a good effect on Max Holloway. So no, I I actually thought Aaron Allen was well ahead, and I I think he actually landed some good shots in the last whatever it was thirty seconds, where Holloway kind of upped the pace as well. So yeah, no, I I, I still think I would have gone for Allen. But it would definitely would have made it closer if he'd like heavily knocked him down. Uh, but yeah, like it, it was one. We'll, look, we'll talk about the, the Jocelyn Edwards fight in a second here. But that was one of those rounds, right? Where Max Holloway landed that big shot late and a couple of big shots just before, right? Like impactful, damaging shots, right? And Arnold Allen probably landed. You know, I, I think he landed seven or eight damaging shots in that round, plus all the other shots that were going, you know, go into it. There's there's a lot to score there. There's a lot to decipher. There's a lot to decide, like, which shot, damaging shot is more than another damaging shot. There's some rounds you're thinking, right, there's no damaging shots on it. How are we going to, you know, how are we going to decide this? And you maybe look for easier things, which we'll get to in a second. But I... Uh, that's the way I would look at that round. Like, I think Max Holler, uh, Aaron Lannan was so far ahead, not so far ahead, but far enough ahead that he could take a big shot. Could he take a knockdown, a hard knockdown where he was out of it? Maybe not. But I don't think that was it, in my opinion. What, did, did you think differently or did you... Yeah, uh, originally I thought that, as I said earlier, I said that Alan was kind of rushing in and got caught off balance. Did I thought he got hit with a couple of shots, but I didn't think it was as clean as it looked on the re- as it was on the replay. But yeah, I do agree that you know that Alan had enough of a enough of a kind of head start or enough of a lead in in that round with, with some really nice work earlier on, and even towards the end of the round again when he kind of he kind of upped it at the start of the the fifth round, and then kind of went into a lull and then upped it again. I think. Uh, in the, at the start and the end, bar the very end of the round, that the, the shots we're talking about where he got dropped, I think he was he was landing some very good shots and definitely uh, you know uh, definitely had a lead and I I, I, I gave it to Alan, but if it had a, if it had have been you know two two going into that round, it probably would have been a harder decision to make if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah, hundred percent. Um. While we're talking about judging, let's talk about the Justin Edwards Lucy Pudilova fight. Look, it was, it was, it wasn't the greatest fight in the world. I thought it was a good performance. For, honestly, a good performance from both of them. I thought Pudilova fought well. I thought Edwards probably fought better than than I've seen her fighting in a long time in the UFC. We'll just talk about the first round because I think look, everyone knows Pudilova won the the second round. Uh, third round was was relatively close, but I thought Edwards did enough. I thought she just landed the more damaging shots, but it came down to the uh, the first round. And this look, we talked earlier about, <laughs> there a second ago about loads of damaging shots, right, and deciphering between them. This one, I think you have to break it down a little bit easier. And like I I was tweeting about it last night, and you know people were saying, oh, you always score damage. Why didn't you score damage in this one? I didn't. Where was the damage in the first round? I would, I would love to know what people are talking about in that. But I think, look, most people do agree that this wasn't a great decision. Now, having watched it back, I, I said, it, I said it was a joke of a decision. I, maybe I went a bit too far. I definitely went a bit too far. It, I think it was a bad decision. Would I say it was a robbery? No, no I wouldn't say it was a robbery. I, I would definitely draw back, and I wouldn't say it was a robbery, robbery. But I just think this was look in these cards. It's funny how the earlier fights. Our, our, the later fights are judged better than the earlier fights. Um, and I think, like, the local judges getting, you know, getting minutes in here is not good. Like, this is a, this first round is a round where an experienced judge will always score that the right way and an inexperienced judge will make a mistake on it. And I think that's what happened All here. three of them scored it for Edwards in yeah. the first round. I, I think that was... And one of these... Look, one of these judges was is a good judge. He's uh, judges a lot of Invicta and, and um, the, the UFC and all. And the other two was, I think, their second ever event. Right? So... And now... I, I'm not calling the judges out here for being fucking terrible or anything. It was, it was a relatively close round. But one... When you go back and look through it... I went back and I looked through it twice now with a fine-tooth comb. And... 
sometimes you have to make these rounds easier on yourself and we talked about an awful lot recently and I've kind of had to be talked down by judges a little bit not wanting to score anything on the ground you know there's five minutes of top control top control doesn't exist and I'm not scoring top control here I'm, just, I'm there I'm, I'm refusing to, to move from that point but you look at this fight right and it's a very 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 easy fight to break down very easy there's three different parts of this fight there's the feet standing on the feet uh, before the fight is taken down, there's a three minutes, 11 seconds of uh, Pudilova having top control, and then there is the few seconds afterwards when they get back up. Let's talk about it in the industry part. The third part of it, uh, first, uh, the fight gets back up. Edwards land, throws maybe four shots uh, in the, the clinches they stand back up, lands one of them, maybe two of them, nodding major there. So look, a couple of good shots. This, the first before before the three minutes and eleven seconds, uh, Edwards landed two right hands. Pudelova landed a punch and in a knee, and I thought that was even. Like go back and watch it. Go back and watch it and show me more than two hard strikes by Edwards. Show me more or less for Edwards. Show me more or less than the two strikes from Pudelova. The one nice, I think it was possibly a left hook, but then the knee was the biggest strike in my opinion. The knee was the biggest strike of those four. I thought it was two all with the knee being the biggest strike. There was little bits of jabs and stuff. Nothing major. Like, even those four shots I talked about, there was nothing major in them. You know, yeah. put it over. Do you think it was close enough that maybe if you were cage, I could hear the shots that maybe a shot snuck in there that had a bit more, you know, had a lot more impact than maybe it seemed on TV. And that's what the judges saw, like, in a, in a, in a round that close. It may, yeah, maybe. Something like that. Like. May, maybe, but. Oh, God, I'm watching it back there wasn't much there really wasn't much and then the fight went to the ground and there was 3 minutes 11 on the ground now people I saw people some people putting up the the stats in this right and I think the stats were 36 shots thrown by Edwards and 17 landed right so she missed I, I, I looked up smart she missed 18 shots and through 36 and all of those were like her throwing hooks off of her back on the ground, landing absolutely none, just doing nothing. Like, we spoke about the, the Volkanovski Makacha fight the last day. He was throwing and hitting him in the face. She was throwing and doing nothing. And, like, they weren't even scored highly in that. Yeah, so for anybody who doesn't know, significant strikes isn't, like, no. a, a, an impactful strike like it sounds like it should be. It's just a strike at range or a strike, you know, it's just kind of any strike, really. It, 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 yeah. No matter the impact. It's I, would a say, I would say Edwards... Impact. Edwards landed zero significant strikes on the ground at 3 minutes 11, right? So here we have a 2-2 before the fight went to the ground, 2-0 to Edwards uh, after the fight got back up, and in the 3 minutes and 11, I counted 6 or 7 good shots by Pudelova. She didn't do loads, so it's 3 minutes and 11 seconds, and I there was only 6 or 7, and I thought maybe 3 of them, maybe 4 of them were as hard as the other shots that we, we saw. So she landed one nice elbow, was probably the best shot of the round. She landed a couple of shots right down through the middle and a couple of hammer fists at one stage as well. So make it easier on yourself, right? Make it easier on yourself. It was even at the start. Pudelova, like, clearly won the three minutes and 11 seconds. She landed all the impactful shots, not massively impactful, go with me here. And then Edwards landed two shots towards the end. Like, Pudelova's 3 minutes and 11 seconds winning that was clearly the most important part of the round. You had an even part of the round, someone 1 or 2 punches ahead towards the end, and then someone 7 or 8 punches ahead right through the middle in, what, 60-70% of the round. Like, I, I, like it's one of those ones where, it, I, I don't know, we... Sometimes when we break down fights and we, we kind of we look past rounds and all of that, but I don't know, I was just watching this clearly and I like the the the, the McCatch of um Volkanovsky won the last there. Like like other lots of different rounds we talk about recently. And I, I think I was wrong on the McCatch of Volkanovsky one, to be honest. And that's why I'm talking about this one as well, because it, it wasn't a similar round, there was a lot more happening in that one and all, but I I talked to a lot of judges after that and st- saw how you probably should be talking about it, right? And the inconsistency of that is a problem because if we have rounds like that and we're we're scoring in different ways, it's not good because how the fuck are we supposed to understand if there's such inconsistency? Now, there isn't loads of inconsistency and as I said, I don't think this was a robbery, but like, this is the sort of round that should be scored that way. Yeah, I think if you had Sal Mato in there, if you had Chris Lee in there, if you had David Leatherby, Ben Carlage, you know, uh, all the be- any of the best judges in the world, I think this would have been, we wouldn't have been talking about it, you know, but uh, yeah, anyway. 
Did, did Sean Sheehan say I was wrong multiple times on this podcast? We, we, oh, hey, what we was the other thing out. I was wrong about? It. <laughs> you were wrong to, to call it out as a joke of a decision. And you were wrong yeah. about Volkanovski and Mac, Mac, Fair Mac enough. Yeah. So, I oof, can be wrong. I can be wrong. Uh, you know? Get the get the clickbait going. Sean Sheehan, I was wrong. Oh, yeah. I was, uh, John, I was right <laughs> about it. We, we can make t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I was right about Jorgen Klopp being shite anyway. Wasn't I? Wasn't I right about that? Anyway, we'll move on. Uh, there was other fights as well. Uh, so Seven Hag wasn't looking too good in the, uh, in the staff, European staff, league there, was he? Staff. Are you, oh, you're still talking about the Seven nearly. Oh, when you're eighth place in the league. Congratulations. Uh, um, uh, yeah, it's good we're not seventh anyway. <laughs> I keep waiting for you to go to seventh so I can make that joke. You were there like once in the middle of one we're of the games. No, we're going to refuse to win <laughs> so you can't make a joke. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Gaston Melanias won. Denise Gomez looked kind of good, but Bruno Brazil is awful. Uh, I thought Daniel Z- Zellhuber in that first round especially looked good, but then Venata came back, won the second, uh, but Zellhuber won the third, I think it was. Uh, and then there was Amber! Uh, uh, I'm back for Gillian Robertson. Good stuff there. Zach Cummins, Ed Herman. Uh, ball retired. Ball looked very old. Uh, Ed Herman with a big belly on him. He looked like me in there. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, was, I think Ed Herman was definitely. It looked like he was there for one last paycheck, in, in fairness. So I don't think maybe. Uh, maybe we'll see him back somewhere else in the future, but I don't think we'll see him back in the UFC, but it looks at things. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't amazing by him, though, no, to be honest. But uh, yeah, congratulations on your retirement. Looking forward to your next one. All right, let's talk uh, a little bit uh, about Cage Warriors. Do you know what? I, I, caught, I caught a bit of Cage Warriors, but also I went back to watch it on... Um, on fight pass and just like it wouldn't work so i didn't i didn't see all of cage warriors i'll, I'll have watched more for the uh the q a tomorrow if you want to send in questions uh on our patreon or uh at uh over on twitter for us but uh, what i did see was the main event george hardwick versus uh, yan lias and um i I pick Lias coming in to, to win my flyer a bit now if i was picking straight up i would have gone I, I, and i think i did go with hardwick but um La- Yan Lias was showing what I thought you know he was kicking well from the outside he was running the pace of the fight just doing so well and he is a very 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 good fighter and then George Hardwick just came and fucking blasted him down the middle knocked him down hard he was on shaky legs for the next what 45 seconds or so until the referee stepped in and, and stopped it standing as George Hardwick basically had him knocked out standing Grant George Hardwick is a fucking problem, isn't he? This guy is a really, really, really good fighter. He's technically good. He can wrestle now as well, but he has the power. Hard, he's going to be a hard guy to stop. He in the fight as he showed. You know, he as you said, it wasn't going his way. It was, it was, it wasn't looking good, and he he turned it up at the right moment. And once he had, once he had him hurt, he you know he stayed patient, but he didn't let him off the hook and. He showed kind of a maturity that he, it's great to see, uh, you know, for his for his future. And he's on a really, he's on a, um, you know, a really, really, uh, you know, is is it time for him to go to the UFC or do you think? I think like, so. No, I think it's uh, definitely. Do you think he needs no. that bigger name or do you think? I think he's ready, but do you think the UFC will be wanting him to fight that bigger name? And you know, I don't know. He's he's finishing everybody. You know, he's making. He's making it look easy in a lot of fights, and he's shown, you know, he can overcome adversity. He's shown it all, basically, uh, in Cage Warriors. And, yeah, I think I think he's re- UFC ready, but I, I get the feeling that these days maybe you might have to do a little bit more, and he, he might be in a situation where he needs to do a little bit more, unfortunately. Yeah, and I was, who was it? I think I was talking to Ian about it the other day. It's like, the UFC and Cage Warriors, like, the, the, when was the last time that, like, they haven't signed that many people recently. Like, you know, they've signed, they've signed a few, and then they always do, but, like, Paul Hughes is looking like he's struggling yeah, to get signed. If he didn't sign Paul Hughes, George Hardwick is probably, you know, in the same boat. Yeah, uh, it's, I don't know what's happened there. Like, they want everyone to go through the contender series so they can pay them less, uh, quite obviously, or go into tough or whatever, and that season has ended now. So, yeah, I, 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 I don't know on that one. Is he enough quality? Like, you put George Hardwick in there with Paddy Pimblett right now, and that's that's a destructive win for, for George Hardwick. and absolutely destroy him, you know? He's well able to be in the UFC. He's brilliant. The same goes for you know for for Paul Hughes, but on him being Paddy Pimblett and being well able to be uh, in the UFC right now. So, yeah, I He's think poor Paddy Pimblett is fucking yeah, sorry, verbal assault catching, here. Catching, <laughs> catching straight me. Poor old Liverpool, they can't uh, they can't catch a break. Jeez, the Grand National was on the other day as so. well. Anyway, uh, do you know what as well? One thing I disagree with you. You said uh, Hardwick had to adjust. I actually and I I don't think he did because. 
I think he means this. It's it's funny because he like I, I'm. Let me just open his record here. I feel like Hardik wins all of his fights between like minute three and five, because like he. So yeah, he's last fight. This fight four twelve. The last fight four thirty six. Two fights before that four minutes. Two fights. Uh, one fight before that two forty eight. Two thirty one. Three forty. He's a lad who just kind of. Do you know right? I was thinking about this earlier. That 340 against Kylie was the second round, though. Yeah. yeah, that's fair enough. But, yeah, then that's true. But he's one of these lads, right? You know, some fighters come on, like a McGregor or a Belfort or whoever, and they try to blitz you early and knock you out. I feel like he's a lad who waits three minutes and then tries to blitz you. When you have, like, already set out your stall, he knows what you're going to do, which is fucking really smart, I think. I've... I've I don't know. I've never thought of that before. I've never thought. I think some lads now are doing it. They fight differently in round two than they do in round one. Yeah, but well, just, Aldo used to do that. He used to kind of wait to see what you were going to do and then kind of, yeah. okay. But I don't think it's even necessarily waiting to see what you're going to do. I think he's just waiting for you to settle and then he attacks you, you know? And that's fucking very, I think that's really smart. I think I think more people could do that. Like, especially like... like lure you into a false sense of security. Yeah, maybe. and then just boom. Like, you know, like the McGregor fast start. Do do that three minutes in. Do nothing for the first three minutes. You're still fresh. Just kind of jab your way on the outside. You know, let them throw their couple of high kicks and they're, you know, they're not probably... As, not as, you, go, as you go up the levels, though, will you come up against guys who will take advantage of you kind of waiting? Maybe, but there's if you're good enough, it's easier to fight defensively and stay safe, I think. You know, if you, okay, if you're going in and you're throwing shots, absolutely, you can get countered, you can get hit or whatever. But if you're taking almost no uh, chances or anything like that and frustrating your opponent a little bit, wait for them to make one mistake and boom, pounce, and you know you're going to pounce, I I, I don't think that's a bad uh, way to fight at all. So, uh, yeah, I was impressed with it. Now, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I'd actually love to ask Josh Hardwick about that. It's also a thing he probably wouldn't tell you, to be honest, because I don't think it's that easy to decipher if it was true. Maybe, maybe people are probably just thinking, oh, he's, you know, a slow starter. I always, I, do you know what? I hate that in MMA. People saying people, uh, people are slow starters. It's like, are they slow starters or are they doing it on purpose? Like, you know? I don't know. Anyway. Um, well, I don't think certain people like Don Cerrone were doing it on purpose, but I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Nathan Fletcher, Dan Deweese, then Jesus, uh, Nathan Fletcher made easy work of this. Uh, and I've watched a bit of Dan Deweese. Um, he's supposed to fight a couple of times in the Cage Warriors, but Fletcher did a great job, won the fight, got the, the triangle and got the finish. Lovely stuff uh, out of him there. And he moves forward. You know, he, if Ken and Locker wins this belt coming up, maybe Nathan Fletcher will be uh, the next one there waiting for him. But we will see on that. My guy, James Power. Your boy, James Power. Wow. He, He's yeah. good, isn't he? He's... Yeah. You know, it's a step up in, mm-hmm. in experience and um, step up in, in in competition. And he just, you know, he looks like he's ready. And I, I always like to slow roll with, with prospects, but... Uh, I think he's he too good, Marley. Yeah, if he keeps performing <laughs> like, like he is, there's mm-hmm. not really much you can do except put him in the big fight. We've seen him with kind of... Kalen Locker and people like that. Sometimes you just gotta. Sometimes they're ready and you just gotta do it. And you know, maybe I'm pulling the trigger too early here, but this performance looked like he, he's ready. Yeah, and he had he didn't have it all his own way in the first round either. When you're not going to against someone like as good as Copera, but that big elbow and to make someone retire in their stool who's been around as long as Copera as well, absolutely gushed him up and like it was. It was really, really, really good. And I think there's even better to come from him. I think he's a fantastic fighter altogether. So definitely one to, to keep an eye on there. Um, yeah, definitely looking forward to seeing the next step up. Obviously, like yeah. we talked about the UC matchmaker is not really having a, a plan. But, you know, when Ian Dean some, and, and the Cage Warriors guys see see somebody of, of talent like this, as I mentioned with Caden Lockren, they they know what to do and they, they will give them every chance to kind of, you know, fulfill their potential. And yeah, I think this is going to be a very exciting two two, three years for, for James Power. Yeah, and this is, uh, the rest of it now is where uh, I miss, so I'll have to go back and watch it. Adam Cullen got a big loss. I did see the the knockout. Uh, Dimitru uh, Grildin landed a big right hook and knocked him out. Uh, so that's a big setback for Cullen. But he's still a very good fighter and you now young in his career. He'll bounce back. Uh, everyone's talking about this Luke Riley, Callum Parker fight, and I'll have to go back and watch that. I will talk about it uh, on the q and I saw a couple of people were asking about the decision and also I definitely will go back and, uh, and watch that. Big win for Chris Bungard against Gavin Hughes. Big win for Matters Flaminas. He can't be too far away at 170, especially maybe enough Reese wins in a couple of weeks and gets signed. Um, that could be important for him. So, yeah, all in all, as always, kind of a, a good uh, a good Cage Warriors card there. Um, we have 
cards next week then as well we have ufc we have bellator we have we've two bellator cards we've ksw uh we have one championship there's uh there's a lot to decipher and a lot to to get through graham for uh for next week um First of all, KSW, they have a ma- they have a massive card coming up. This is not one of their their massive cards, but they have a massive card coming up. The 170 pound title is on the line here, though. Um, Adrian Bartosinski against Arthur Skipiak, whose names I pronounced uh, 100% well. Uh, and I'm sure Sean Linney will have a breakdown of all of that. But most importantly for Ireland, uh, Henry Felipe is on this uh, against Marcin Krovekiak, who's uh, 11 and 4. You know, Felipe has been on. Um, a serious run uh, over the last while, and especially since he got to uh, to KSW, you know, he's won this fight, and, uh, won his last fight, and into a big one now. Beat John Redmond before that, had won a fight as well um, uh, against Lucas Staniek before uh, that. After he made his comeback against Ali McLean in, in 2021, so it's four and zero now in in his last few fights for Henry Felipe and Graham. You've always said that if Felipe can put a run together, if he can. Um, you know, if he can be a fulfill professional, his, fulfill his abilities and his yeah. talents that he in there in his early his early pro career, not really training. If you it, it, the rumblings you hear and you know hasn't really worked on and things like that, and obviously his striking ability, his his uh, athleticism, his uh, his all round game is just is just really good. And and you know sometimes it just has to click and maybe some time off and coming back has done him well. And he's kind of flying under the radar a little bit as well, which, which may help as well. Sometimes some, some guys, you know, they want the hype or whatever. Other guys like to just kind of do their talking in the cage. And he's, he's definitely been doing that. And this is, this is a big fight for him. And, you know, uh, I expect him to go in there and win. He's a very dangerous guy, especially on the feet early. And yeah, he's a, uh, he definitely seems to be putting it together and it'd be interesting to see how he does here. And, and if he does win, um, what, what, what KSW do with him? Indeed, yeah, hundred uh, percent. UFC's card in next week. Thirteen fights, Graham is probably the most important part of it uh, for <laughs> for me. The main event: Ser- Sergey Plavlovich against uh, Curtis Blades. You know, if Sipe fights Jones, this will probably decide who the the next contender is. Maybe so. And and also, John Jones was talking about retiring against Sipe last night. So maybe maybe this is something you'd never know. This might decide the next champion, or uh, it might decide who's the next to fight for the. Uh, uh, for the vacant belt, if that does happen now, in my retirement and all that, we'll see on that. But look, it's an interesting one. Pavlovich hits hard blades, hits hard blades. A good wrestler, Pavlovich can wrestle a bit as well. Who's going to win? Who who knows? We'll we'll find out. Um, Song Yilong versus Ricky Simon. That's a good technical fight, kind of written all over it. I think. Uh, Bruno Silva fighting Brad Tavares. Bobby Green against Jared Gordon. That Bobby Green, Jared Gordon one is all the markings of me of like, let's get Jared Gordon a win here so you don't have to give him to Paddy Pimlet again <laughs> type of thing because like, yeah. Oof, I don't know. I think Bobby Green, like he's I think he'll probably going to win this pretty handy. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, I think they want Bobby Green to beat him. So that's like, ah, uh, sure. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, yeah, yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, so. Oh, uh, yeah, and I do think, I think Bobby Green will win that pretty handily enough. Uh, you know, if Bobby Green, Bobby Green should call out Benny Pimlet after that, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's other people on the card as well. He, he might have to fake a retirement to get to get the microphone yeah, <laughs> if yeah. he does win. Yeah, but geez, they weren't happy with Clay Guida actually doing that, were they? He, he, I have three people to wish a happy birthday, and after like one and a half of them, Daniel Carmio was pulling away the, <laughs> the way the microphone. Obviously, being told to do that as well. But yeah, uh, Mohammed Usman on the card. Yeah, who cares? Um, Bellator uh, actually before that one championship have a card uh, the top fight and this is a kickboxing uh, matchup so we leave that uh, where it is um, there's a, a couple of interesting fights though 8-0 Halil Amir against 6-0 uh, Maurice Avedi I think that's going to be a very good fight if people are tuning in one of the best uh, women in the world as well is fighting on this Mingbo uh, she's fighting against Diana Cardoso um, and yeah there's some other uh, some other fights on it as well uh, we've 115 pound uh, fight as well which could uh, see the next contender for Jared Brooks's title although he's beaten both of them before so you know maybe not uh, then Bellator how do you see this Pat, Patchy Mix uh, starts fight going? This is a very interesting one. It's a great fight. Uh, my natural first thought is to go Rafi on Stotts, but like underestimate Patchy Mix at your peril. This guy is a fucking very good fighter and has improved an awful lot over the last while. His jiu-jitsu is good. He keeps catching lads in it. Like Stotts is a good striker and a very, very good wrestler. Um, 
but like Mix's striking has improved as well. Like uh, it was funny when he was watch, uh, fighting James Gallagher. Like I went back and I watched a lot of him. And I was like, oh Jesus, Mix isn't that good of a striker. And you know that was credit to James Gallagher. People love the shit in James Gallagher. That was a relatively even fight. You know, Mix, Mix was ahead and ended up you know winning obviously. But you know it was a pretty good level. And the level that Mix has showed since that, I think, is very very high. So. Um, yeah, that win over Horiguchi, uh, yeah. you know, that, that was a huge win. Really, and Maga Madoff as well, like that guillotine choke. Was, you know, I was kind of in the same boat where I think I was thinking Pachi makes me, he's phenomenal on the ground, but maybe he's lacking on the feet, but he's, he, he seems to close. Like, he seems to be improving a lot in between fights. And I think I think I was underestimating him a lot, but I I think he's going to get this done, I think. Do you? I, Interesting. Yeah, I think, I think he's shown like really big improvements in, in between fights. That win over Haraguchi is, is, is massive and uh, obviously his last fight uh, that I mentioned. So, yeah, it's obviously a, it's a hard one to call, but uh, yeah, I think he might get it done here. Yeah, I, I think Stotts wasn't at his best against Sabatello either in the last fight, but that's a hard matchup and a very different matchup from this one as well. I, I just... I think both of these guys, I think the world of both of these guys, honestly, I think they're fucking brilliant. Uh, and this, look, 135 pounds all over the world is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, love this fight. Love this fight. Not sure who's going to win, honestly, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing it. Um, some other interesting fights on, on both of these cards as well. Um and even I'm a look, this is in Hawaii, and it's funny, Dan we can't do a fight in Hawaii. Like, Bellator are doing two fights next week in Hawaii. So it's, it's weird. And Limele is is going to be the star here fighting Kano Anatabe. Aaron Pico's on this card. His opponent fell out, I think, yesterday. I've got a new opponent in James Gonzalez. Your guy, Kyoji Haraguchi, uh, he's fighting against Ray Barg at 125. Ray Borg. Ray Borg, yeah, indeed. Two of the, the, the former opponents of the GOAT, Demetrius Johnson. So that'll be interesting. Mads Brunel is back here against uh, Justin Gonzalez. Uh, Kai Kamaka, one of my uh, one of one of my favorite Twitter followers, is back fighting Adley Edwards. Uh, Keone Diggs on the card is going against Weber Almeida, who's very good on the ground. Elira Joanna, but also the, the night before as well, the uh, women's 125 pound title is on the line. Rematch between Liz Carmouche and Deanna Bennett. I went back and I watched that match the other day, the first one. Good finish for Liz Carmouche, but not you know not the best fight in the world. I think it's going to be similar here. Like Carmouche has just been doing so well finishing people and winning fights recently. Uh, apart from that weird one with the bad sabotage, but you know what I mean. And you know, uh, it's, it's a rematch, and we talk, we talked over the last few weeks about rematches, and you know the person who won the last fight very rarely loses the, the next one. Um, even though Bennett is kind of the younger, maybe more up and coming fighter here than uh, than Carmouche who's obviously been around. No, but she's not. Actually, she's thirty eight. Is she younger? Jeez, uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But she's won her last two in a row, last three in a row, even uh, after losing to uh, to Carmouche. Let's see what age Carmouche is. I'm going to guess thirty six. Let's let's have a look here. Thirty nine. Okay, so you have a thirty nine year old against a thirty eight year old. She is younger, so I was right. But uh, yeah, that. Uh, I'm interested. I I I feel like I have to pick Carmouche in that one, but uh, we we'll see how it goes. Tim Johnson, Saeed Soma, someone's probably getting knocked out, or else it turns into a slap fest. A uh, big fight for the 145 pound division. Sarah McMahon against Blinko. If Sarah McMahon wins that, she's into the conversation with the likes of Zingano, with the likes of Sinead Kavanaugh at the top of that division. So a big fight for her coming into Bellator. Uh, your guy Danny Sabatella is back here fighting Marcus Breno, one of the best prospects in uh, in uh, Bellator is bouncing back here. Levin Cashelli uh, taking on uh, Michael Lombardo, and there are other fights on the card as well. I think we've gotten to everything, Graham. Have we? I think we've we've talked about all the all the stuff and all whatever's gone on. Sure, look, PFL uh, had a they did. What was the P- PFL three? They did. Setabu C one. Go on, talk us through it there. What else? What else had we, Graham? And a nice head head kick by uh, um, Magomed Karimov um, against uh, yeah you know <laughs> what uh, I think we're a bit we're a bit spoiled uh, without having the, some kind of Irish interest on the card I wasn't as into this card as as yeah. I have been in the in the other you know even if it kind of had interest in terms of the tournament if they had like you know points were available in the in the in the divisions like the Wilf- Will Furries division for example it probably would have had more interest but uh yeah it was a decent card but there wasn't there wasn't too much drawing power on it uh for me yeah it was weird as well because the card was backwards I think because they had it was so clashing with something in MMA in, in uh, ESPN so they had the main card first and then the undercard after it which was kind of weird but as you said look 
Yeah. So, the Clay Collard fight against uh, what was it? Uh, Nishikawa was 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 good fun. You know, Clay Collard mm-hmm. working the body, working the boxing, but he was getting his leg absolutely both legs in the end absolutely brutalized. Uh, and you know, it, the fight nearly turned on that. But yeah, Clay Collard definitely did enough to win the fight. But it was it was very interesting and you know, very good fight. Did you see the Oba Mercia Shane Burgos fight? Yeah, I did. Yeah, what, yeah. What was that like? I actually didn't see it. Tell us. Um, yeah, just kind of. Oh, oh, I am just kind of frustrated. Burgos. Uh, <laughs> he definitely, he definitely deserved a decision. I, I, I don't think there was much. Um, was there, was there much contention about that? I don't know. I didn't hear anything about it. Like, I, my thoughts coming into it were like that. OAM is just really good at fucking controlling fights, Sydney, and Burgos is going to have problems with that. Is that the way it went? Yeah, that's pretty much how, how it goes. You know, Burgos didn't really get a chance to get off and was just left frustrated. And you know, he he, he knew at the the final bell that he he lost. It wasn't it wasn't close. But uh, yeah, I think um, you know uh, before that says it says it for a for a former UFC for he just looked. Um, he looked, uh, I don't know, he looked... He came in on short notice, so literally like two days notice, I think. And Goldsap oh, is very okay. good. Oh, so. okay, I, I didn't know that. He, lo- yeah, he looked yeah. like he didn't want to be there. I don't yeah. know what was going on, but that makes more sense now that he was called He's in off the street. Up and heavyweight too, I think, wasn't he? Was he a 185er before, if I'm not mistaken? He was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. But I, I think they're, like... I, I thought it would be just giving up on uh, <laughs> they put a look of him. Yeah, it, yeah. it makes more sense now that you explain it. So, Goldsav was supposed to fight last week and so was Sean Brady his initial opponent both of their fights fell out they weren't supposed to fight each other then they were supposed to fight each other this week and then Brady fell out as well and then uh, Cesar Machanchik came in uh, on like wins there so yeah it's it's very hard with these you know the tournaments or the seasons or whatever to actually like keep everyone going because if Golsov doesn't get a fight here he misses out on getting his six points as he did get and then it's very tough to get to the next round like when are you going to get that fight in there they don't have another card for like six weeks or something so yeah, that's one of the, the drawbacks of it. But like for for PFL, they're kind of the big names. I think all got the wins here, like the Umalatov, who's a top fighter, thirteen and all. He got a win here to start it off. All but Mercia got a win. I was uh, PFL has been doing this thing where they're making a lot of big fights in the first weeks, and I don't know is it the right way to do it. Like you got you signed Burgos on big money, and you got him a loss in his first outing. Like does that make sense? I I don't know. I think that's a bit weird. But now you know. if they put him in uh, kind of. One that he can get a quick six in or whatever. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Can, yeah, but it, it's, it's no kind of guarantee. strange where they can kind of look after whoever they want to look after. It's it's a bit of a. I yeah. prefer if it was more kind of a uh, like if it's if they're going to call it like a regular season or a league kind of thing. I'd prefer if it was more kind of bracketed. Or, yeah, or do a draw or something. Or, like I, I yeah, just uh, like have a draw in a bracket. Like yeah, yeah. it'd be. It'd be interesting to tune in to see what the matchups are going to be as well. Like you do a live like, draw. To be fair, the matchmaking is actually very fair. Like matching Burgos against Auburn Mercia is good matchmaking. Like it's just because it's in. Oh, well, you can't use them. Yeah, you can. You can't use. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's actually the opposite of what people might think. You know, it's like oh, they're trying to fucking. They're trying to set this up. They're they're actually doing the quite the opposite of that. They're trying to not say, I want them to set it up, but they're not, yeah, they're, they're they're not doing it. So you know, we have to give credit for that. To be fair, fair play, but. Yeah. Um, some fighters you might get the short end of the stick you might fight yeah. like you know Will Flurry fight a Jocko get a three point des- uh, decision win and then maybe fight a you know Rob uh, Wilkinson Santos or, something. or uh, yeah. Wilkinson you know what I mean and it, it's going to be very difficult to get six points or five points or four points in that you, you'd be lucky to get three so it, it can kind of you know some fighters might feel a bit uh, aggrieved by the, the matchmaking but yeah a, a draw would kind of you know take all of that away yeah indeed um I, I think there was, what, there was 12 fights in this. I think at the time I picked it, I think there was 11. I think I picked 10 out of the 11, correct, if I'm uh, if I'm uh, not mistaken. I picked a lot of them correct, and maybe nine. So good picking out of me, good picking out of me. Magomed, Magomed, Karimov, as you said, head kick, one of the knockouts of the year on that. And Sadabusi got a good finish as well over Jared al Shalawi. Like, C is a guy who did, did a lot of controlling in fights, and now he's kind of opened the pace and has become... Uh, maybe more set in uh, his place in PFL, and he won it last year. He could very well win it again this year, the way he's going. But we have Magomed, Magomed Karimov uh, this year back. We have uh, Umalatov back as well this year. Carlos Leal got a good win as well, so very uh, interesting time for the PFL. And we will see them back here in about six weeks again. Um. Right, I think uh, I think that's just about it. Was there any Was there any big news during the week or anything? Around? I can I have an I have an awful bad memory. I don't I don't remember half of these. You know these things that go on MMA kind of 
you know, it bypasses me sometimes and we could have anything could have happened. We we didn't we didn't have a big like merger with the WWE or anything last week anyway. We had no, that there was there was no news on anything to do with that or anything, no. No, I, no, I didn't from the WWE side of things or uh, the pro wrestling side of things. I didn't hear and no, I didn't really hear anything about it. I think kind of Vince McMahon is back a little bit uh in, in WWE, but they're kind of saying oh he's not really back, but he kind of is. But yeah, I don't think much happened there. One thing did happen, uh if Olive has stepped in now to fight Bryce Mitchell on UFC two eight eight. That's an interesting fight. Oh, also, um, Charles Oliveira is out of the fight with Benil Dariush, and uh, so someone asked. So do you, think, do you think they try to rebook it, or do you think they give, they push Dariush up, or That's, what do yeah. you think is going to happen? Uh, someone asked the Dana White that exact question last night, and so they asked him, "Do you want to rebook the fight, or do you want to put Dariush into a title shot? He's earned it." And he goes, "Yeah, I think that's what we're going to do." And I'm like, "Hold on." Which, what, did he say yeah to the first question there or the second question? And no one followed up. It's like, ah, oh, so confusing. So uh, it looks like they're going to uh, put it back. Just the way he likes it. Again. So no, no matter which way you go with it, he can, he yeah, can say he the opposite. Say, I, I, goof. I, I was right. You're a goof. Yeah. You fucking goof. What did you think of uh, him calling the schmo a goof? Did you see that? He was like, I can't believe these idiots <laughs> are asking such questions. I'm like, are you? It's been a while serious? since he called me a goof, has it? Or am I just. Uh, I, I don't think he goofs. actually. I don't think he called him a goof. I was. I. I said he called him a goof. Uh, yeah. Like you. 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 you credential. What do you, what, what do you think about the like? Mm. You know, do you see your credential and kind of people who are doing kind of comedy characters? What do you think about that? Do you think like does that happen in other sports? I don't think that does that happen. Maybe in the like, maybe in it's more of an American thing where you can kind of yeah, I don't know. I Over know. here in in Ireland, if somebody was in the press box acting like that, it would be extremely strange. It would be really strange, yeah. But like, have a media there, right? And ha- if you have your media there in a Windsor or whatever, have a media there for actual like journalists or actual media members covering it properly, trying to create content and trying to you know get stories out there, whatever it might be. And if you want to have these goofs at it, or you want to have like TikTokers or whatever, do like um you know an influencers hour or whatever, and give them that time with the fighter. And, like there's no problem with that. Like I don't see any problem with Bar still doing a comedy thing with Billy Q or you know the Schmo doing a, an idiotic interview with someone. Let them at it, no problem. But don't mix that yeah, up with actual journalists. Crack, like, but it's not like, yeah, yeah it's not. Don't mix yeah. it up with journalism. Like, that's not what it is. And it, that's what they do because, and this is case in point. Because Dana White, he's on Pac McAfee show and he goes, This guy acting, uh, asking about uh, who would you like to hit with a steel chair? What a fucking idiot. These media guys. He's like, He is not a media guy. He's the furthest thing you could see from media. <laughs> from journalism. Do you think Dana's, Dana's uh, media hit piece documentary series is going to be about people like the Schmo and so oh, Or is it actually going to be yeah. about the media? Yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't know. I, I, it's, it's hardly about the schmo anyway, because he fucking, he used to like the schmo. But like, uh, Dana White sees Kevin Ioli and he sees the schmo and he sees, the, like, they're all the media. Like, <laughs> like, what? There couldn't be more of a fucking, although Kevin Ioli is pretty bad as well. But like, let's say, say Josh Gross and or Karim Zidane or, you know, so Ben Fox or something like that and the schmo. Like, they're not the same. It's just not the same. People are actually talking about the sport in a, journalistic proper way and then you have one doofus dressed up yeah. well, in, like in uh, fairness like what people idiot. seem to like his stick or whatever but like I'm, uh, no I'm problem like, it was you that, like you know it just kind of in my opinion it wouldn't really it, 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 the UFC credentialing just kind of anybody and everybody like not not even a small you see other people who are not even you know they're just there for a free ticket or to say they were yeah. media or whatever you, they need to st- kind of decide what their policies are a bit more uh Strictly, I think. But actually, I, I actually don't, I don't like it. But I, I think there's nothing wrong with what he's doing. But you can't put him in a press conference. Like, let him do. Yeah, like, no, he can come and make funny videos with the fighters yeah, on fight week or no uh, post fight, do interviews, stuff like that. Have a bit of crack, like, and, and entertain people. Like, great. Like, if people enjoy that, then that's great. Yeah, there's this guy Nardwar. I know a lot of people will probably know him, but go look at him up on YouTube. He's absolutely brilliant right he he dresses up and he puts on these weird glasses and like this weird hat and stuff right and he interview he's in canada i think and he interviews uh musicians so he's interviewed like you know uh jay-z and billy eilish oh, some of the biggest in the world right and he asks them these like he asks them these questions about things that you could not possibly know right 
So if he was interviewing you, Graham, he could say, oh, um, how did you learn to bake cookies from your Aunt Grace in, in 1992 or something? You're like, what? How the fuck do you know? I've never said that in an interview. Like, he says things like that. He shocks them. He's like, what? How the fuck? And there's some great clips out there, right? That That's brilliant. There's nothing wrong with that. He's like, and he's a goof and he's weird. There's nothing wrong with creating content like that whatsoever. But having that in a press conference is is just and actually his questions would be actually be good for a press conference to be honest. But in general, you know what I yeah, mean. Do you remember? Do you remember Dennis Penis? Do you remember yeah, Dennis Penis? Of course. Like having Dennis Penis at an actual like serious <laughs> press conference. Strutter, 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 strutter. Remember that show? Strutter. Was it, was it the Strutter show? That was it. Your man. Uh, yeah, you remember fucking, when he walks up to the lady? Uh, he's in like France or something. He has like a uh, like a book of, of of French, and he's trying to like pretend that he needs help. And he's like, uh, "Could you?" Uh, Please uh, get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he was uh, he was a mad joke that lad. Yeah, he, but he used to go to red carpets and stuff as well, didn't he? And he would just ask him like really inappropriate questions and stuff. Yeah, but oh yeah, but he's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't seen him before, just type in like Dennis Penis uh, yeah. Best Bits on Indeed. YouTube or whatever. It's very funny stuff. It's like Ali G kind of stuff before Ali G. Yeah. All right, we leave it there. We've gone on for fucking long enough. Bleed it on now. So uh, if you're listening to this, thank you very much. Please hit the subscribe button. There's only like 10% of people who listen to it actually subscribed. So if you're listening on SoundCloud especially, please subscribe. If you're listening on uh, Podcast Republic or iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, if you could leave a review, even that'd be great. Just say, great podcast, five stars or whatever. That's all we want to hear. Or, you know, Sean's the best Graham, he's okay. Four star. You know, I've actually got some some good news. Uh, yeah, Harry Maguire starts the centre back from. Ah, uh, don't Manchester. be saying that to me. <laughs> don't be saying that to me. Oh God! But to be fair, who who else do we have? We're fucked. If this was Liverpool with the injuries Man United have, they'd be asking for the season to be cancelled and all. You know, so we leave it at that. Thanks. Right, here you are bringing up the injuries at the first sign of a couple of injuries. You know. <laughs> The, I the, didn't. The butcher, you the butcher broke broke a baby oh. bone and his baby toe and started crying. Leave the yeah, little butcher the alone. Butcher. Leave the butcher alone for. What about this thing about? Oh, I don't want to start this. I shouldn't. But you know, Jamie Carragher acting like Nemanja Vidić was useless when he won Player of the Year twice. Like Nemanja Vidić is one of the best players of all well, time. The game has just moved on. Like he was a brilliant player for his for his day. He got exposed no. in the big games. But uh, hold on now, hold on now. Okay, did you see? This? <laughs> Did you see the Torres sense? used to rip him to shreds. He used to get sent off at Anfield every time. He played 14 times against Torres. Torres scored three goals against Man United in those 14 games. Yeah, he got sent off at Anfield in a 4 1. Yeah. Did you not hear what I just said? Are you just ignoring yeah, that? Yeah, like, yeah, ripped yeah, apart yeah. Every Liverpool, Liverpool were crap until Torres <laughs> and Jared were. And they're were, crap and again. Alonso and Mashal came along. We were. Again. The Jimmy Traore and the boys, you know. Remember, uh, remember when Virgil van Dyke used to be good? Remember that? That was classic. Yeah, yeah. Good, they were good times, weren't they? Fuck's sake. <laughs> Are you still on and, the train? And no, hold on, actually. This is this is funny that you bring that up because do you remember after that happened, um, Michael Oliver said he didn't do anything. He didn't punish uh, Pickford because the Liverpool players didn't surround him enough and shout in his face. Really? No, I never now, heard that. That's Yeah, he came out and said that was the reason that he literally, it was like a shocking thing he said. You can look it up. And then now, if you come near a ref and shout in his face, they want you, you get an A match ban and they want you banned for more, but the ref can go and elbow people in the throat. Yeah, what did you like, think about ah, that? Don't worry about it. Uh, that is outrageous. What the way the media spun it against like Robbo from the very beginning was was just absolutely he's a, he is a bit of a baby though, isn't he? He's a bit baby. Yeah, but baby. like, you know, players run up to like every time if you watch any match, any time at half time, there's gonna be one player or more from each side kind of like running up to talk to the ref or the linesman or something. It's a normal thing. It's a, it wasn't extra aggressive, it wasn't anything like that. And he's elbowed him in the throat and it's just Absolutely ludicrous. It wasn't he, a ma- it wasn't like, actually elevator, unbelievable though. that he that he got away with it. Like the I, way I, the media span it, span it for him straight away. Like yeah. the, the, I would the, actually the blaming. I would tend I would tend to agree with you. I think he should probably been given a three match ban. You know, like a, 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 if someone got sent off for doing the same thing, they get a three match ban. That's what I think he should have got. So I tend to agree with you. To be honest, even though like we we normalize now this overreaction to. Barely any contact, like oh, uh, Robson holding his face. Oh, I broke my face. Like get over it, you little baby. Like uh, Robson was more in fairness to him. He's more like in shock. You could see he was just kind of hand on his face, being like, "What the fuck just happened?" It yeah. was more. It wasn't like, like he rolled around or also you went, walk like you walk up behind the man, you catch him. Like what's he supposed to do? Not elbow you in the face? Like come on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we're now like football's gonna have a lot of elbows in the face if this yeah. is the way we're going. Yeah, let him off. I I think bring back fucking punching the face in soccer and stuff. Like, I, I really just see Harry Kane last week go, oh no I got touched in the face fucking bullshit I actually like 
I'm, now that Man United are going to shit again, I'm beginning to hate the sport again. So it's How about what Harry Kane does, it? Oh, he's engineered the foul there beautifully. Oh yeah, the, as I said, it, it's the Scotland captain versus the England captain, wasn't that it? Like I'm kind of on your side in this one now, to be honest. Like if that happened to Harry Kane, this lad would be fucking hung, drawn, and quartered. You know, yeah, I do agree just, with you. You know, different rules for for different players, different teams. It's, 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 a, it's a sham. It's a sham. Oh, hopefully Harry Maguire gets in off today <laughs> anyway we won't have to see him for another while <laughs> right, we leave it there right follow us on Twitter uh, f- check out our, our good friends over at Caldera Lab at Manscaped as well uh, and please support them because they support us and uh, Patreon patreon.com forward slash Severe May Podcast at Severe May over on Twitter at Severe May Pod as well on, on Twitter and Severe dot com on Instagram that's grown if, if, if you go to Severe May dot com for us that's links you can get all yes. those uh, links in the handy get place get all there very handy place alright we leave it there Graham give us your quote for the week I can't seem to face up to the facts I'm tense and nervous I can't relax I can't sleep because my bed's on fire don't touch me I'm a real live wire fucked it up at the end there that was a good one though we'll see you next week good luck <laughs>